Hello, everybody. Andy Jacob here with the dot-com magazine entrepreneur spotlight series. I have a great show today. I'm very, very honored to have Mr. Andrew Morton, the CEO of Bloom Health Partners on the show today. And everybody knows that watches the show. We are so fascinated at dot-com magazine about business and of course about health and what happens inside a business with regard to keeping employees healthy, making sure that the employees have a great engaging opportunity to provide the superior service that the clients both expect and deserve. And you can only do that when you're feeling good. You can only do that when you're feeling healthy and businesses need to have healthy employees to keep their business running. And occupational health is a very big, big umbrella of things that are going on in the world today. And Andrew's one of the leaders from Bloom Health Partners. So it's great to have him on the show. Andrew, welcome to the dot-com magazine entrepreneur spotlight series today. And great to be here. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. It's a real honor. We've been waiting to get you on the show, of course. You're one of the leaders in the field. I have so many questions about what you do and diagnostic testing and you know occupational health. But before we get started, well, let's pull the lens back to 30,000 feet and tell us what Bloom Health Partners is all about. Certainly. Bloom Health Partners, is, we like to call ourselves operational health because we really are about the employer or the organization. You know, health has become a component of keeping an organization running. You know, we, in the last couple of years, I think everybody has had some kind of brush with the, the health care. Uh, COVID, let's, let's face it, it's very, a very real thing. And all that's really done is put a spotlight on the need for health in the workplace. You know, Things like occupational care and health in the workplace, that hasn't changed in decades. You know, we recognize there has to be a more innovative way, innovative way of doing this. And Bloom was really founded around those principles. And we started off, we'd be done a lot of COVID testing, which we continue to do, but that's only really part of what we do. The bigger piece here is keeping organizations running, showing them that we, in crisis mode, we can do this for you. But long-term, for long-term longevity, if you want to attract employees, you want to keep things running, there's a better way. And, and, and it's through healthcare. You know, whenever somebody works in an organization, whenever they get hired, the first thing they always say is, first of all, what's the package? But the second thing they always say is, what are the benefits? Health being the top of that list, usually well above the 401k or anything else. Yeah, it makes all the sense in the world. And when we think about it, whether it's a small business or a Fortune 100 company or some of the biggest companies in the world, if that workforce isn't healthy, if that workforce is having problems, if that workforce is behind the scenes having challenges or challenges with their health care or their insurance or whatever it is, it's going to negatively impact their performance within the business. Isn't that the way that it works? Without, without question. You know, it, health is everything. You know, there's, a, there's a bunch of things that have happened here. You know, we're now sitting in a place where I like to call it a seller's market for employment. You know, as, a, as a prospective employee, you have choices. There is, a, there is definitely a worker shortage. And this traverses Everything from minimum wage workers all the way up to really high end, you know, lawyers and doctors and that kind of thing. There's a real opportunity here uh, for the employee to have a, a really be able to play a card in their future in a company. And the challenge for an employer now is how do I attract that talent, that talent? But here's the other kind of side of that. I'm sitting here as an employer. Imagine myself. I run a big factory, which I don't. But if I did, I probably have, you know, thousands of workers many of which are kind of 45, 55 plus up in that range, starting to age, you know, and let's face it, things like diabetes and those sorts of things, which are conditions that are very real, starting to set in, you know, how am I going to keep that worker healthy and get a few more years out of them? Because replacing that machinist or that carpenter, that's a complicated thing. You can't go to some school to find necessarily the machinist. That's an on-the-job skill. You get more life out of that worker through a better healthcare plan, that changes everything. And yeah, so powerful. Yeah, Andrew, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, I didn't mean to cut you off there, but what you just said resonated for me so greatly. And for the people watching the show, I mean, rewind what Andrew just said. That's such an important piece of information because as employers, if you can keep your staff healthy, you're going to decrease the amount of turnover and turnover costs companies millions and billions of dollars every single year. So this is a great way to not only keep your workforce healthy, but also to save a lot of money and increase your profitability, increase your bottom line, increase your gross margins, increase your net margins. Andrew, when we look at large companies and you work with so many of them, of course, 
what's the give back? Is are they really starting to look at employers, you know, and say to say to themselves, listen, we want to keep them healthy. We want to, you know, give them some great nutritional guidelines. We want to give them exercise guidelines. You know, we want them all feeling good. What's the sort of vibe right now that's going on in the industry? Well, the vibe, it's funny. I was talking to one Fortune 50 CEO very recently about this. And he, he this is exactly what he told me. He says, look, here's my problem. I've got Gen Z workers coming into the workforce. This individual operates in a number of major markets across the U.S. I don't want to say too much because I've got to be careful. To, I've got to ask my sources if I can quote him directly. But what he did flat out say is in every single market that I operate in, there's an Amazon factory or, or well, picking, you know, pick pack center down the street. And they're paying $18 an hour and offering free health care. So how do the rest of us, and you know, speaking for this paraphrasing a little bit, how do we compete with that? How are we going to attract that individual? And if we give them health care on site and we give them a better way of doing things, that's probably at least at the very least something that maybe an Amazon or somebody else isn't doing. Maybe if you know insurance is one thing, but if everything happens at the factory floor, that makes it so much easier. You know, and, you know we're not doing open heart surgery at the factory. I mean, that's kind of ridiculous, but we, we are definitely doing preventative care. The entry point for a lot of them was COVID testing because they recognized they had to get start bringing a health program of some kind just to manage conditions. And what they recognized we did differently than the other types that were doing testing at the time was you weren't just coming in with a whole bunch of tests and just throwing volume at it. We brought software and data with it. So the idea is they can now track and trace and figure out how many workers have been tested, how often, how recently, and start planning around events. So the idea is keep things open. We did the same thing for the, for the film and TV industry. We learned it all there, which is a very dynamic environment. And for the employer, the challenge is, how do I get that worker to want to work for me? You know, I, I can't imagine somebody, you know, myself, you know, as a CEO ever having to say that, but I am saying that now myself. How do I attract employees? It's health. You know, it seems to me it's a very basic thing. And it's a very hot topic, whether you're here in the U.S. in mean, what is a privatized system or in some socialized you know, medicine country like Canada or, 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 or you know, the United Kingdom, one of those places, access to health care is paramount no matter what, what the status is. Yeah, that's remarkable, Andrew. It makes all the sense in the world, of course. One thing that separates Bloom from so many other companies is you're data driven and you know you have so much great information, not only for your company, but to give to your clients. What does it look like onboarding, Andrew? I mean, you have a company, whether they're a small to mid-sized company or a Fortune 100 company or one of the biggest companies in the world, and they reach out to you or you know, a member of your team at Bloom and they, they're, they're interested. What does the onboarding look like? What's sort of the big problem? that they are having in their business, why they reach out to Bloom right now? Great question. It's, it's usually the small things first, and then they start to realize as they peel back the onion, there's bigger things going on. You know, out of the gate, some of the bigger companies have the same challenges. And we learn this from people that we, you know, frankly, won you know, really good friendships with because we proved that we could deliver in a time of real crisis. You know, testing was happening. It got a bit crazy. And they turned to us and said, we have this other problem. The other problem is workers' compensation. So what many large insured companies do, because as you know, it's the law, you've got to provide health insurance. If you have workers who are working over 35 hours a week, that's the law. So they're offering health insurance. However, the challenge is if they have seasonal workers, those seasonals don't actually hit the plan. But the challenge they have is somebody, if somebody gets hurt on a, on a shop floor somewhere or in a factory, meat packing plant, whatever it is, generally what the employers will do is rather than putting on the insurance plan is they'll send them to the doctor and pay the bill because you don't want those hits to come onto your insurance plan. And that that there's a real cost to that, you know, and like anything else, the insurance companies look at this and go, well, this is a high risk environment. We've got to raise your premiums. And that's like, nobody wants that. Right. So generally they start with that and they realize, you know, you know, without giving away too much, because there's some confidential information I got to be very careful about. One employer told me flat out, they spent millions a year just on sending people to the doctor out of their pockets, straight cash. If we, if they said to us to start this whole thing, a whole thing off, if you guys put a couple of clinics out there, you know, within reach of, you know, either end of our factory, so people, if somebody gets hurt and they go to that station and it's more than just an emergency station where they just triage somebody and, you know, and send them off. Well, if you can do that, that's going to solve a whole bunch of problems for us. And they actually gave us a list of everything that they were doing. They said, how many of these problems can you solve? And it turned out we were able to solve something like 90% of them just there at the factory floor. It just took having a good you know, PA, physician's assistant some good telemedicine on site. Maybe you drop a device in there that does ultrasounds and a couple of diagnostics. You mix a whole bunch of stuff. If it's a real world situation where somebody has a really critical thing, well, that's maybe where you shift them to the healthcare system. But for 90% of it, we could have dealt with it right there for them. And that's why they wanted us in. It starts there. Then they start to realize, well, what else can you do? 
you know, how many diabetics do you think we have? And I say, well, there's a, there's a way for us to find that out. We happen to own a network of labs. We can help you with that and so on. Yeah, it's so brilliant. I mean, when you think about the workman's compensation claims, it makes sense that so many companies deal with that and handle that themselves. Of course, they reach out to you and your team at Bloom and, and you know, through the collaboration, it's, hey, let's put an on-site, you know, clinic on. Let's, let's do some ultrasound. Let's, let's give some frontline help to these people because we care about our employees and we want to give them the best possible medical opportunity. And, and in this particular case, with this example, it was a decision made to put a clinic right on site or two of them on each end of the plant. I mean, it's fantastic the way you think outside the box at Bloom Health Partners. I love it very much. Now, let's talk about corporate culture because mm -hmm. you've built an amazing team. I mean, you've got the best of the best working with you over at Bloom. How important is it for you to build your company from within with the types of people that you've been able to attract to come work at Bloom Health Partners? I always say this, it is about the people. It's about the team you put yourself, you surround yourself with. You know, I, I myself, I always like to joke that I don't come by this honestly, I come from the tech industry. But what I recognized when I came into this business was, you know, you have literally generations of really, really smart people coming up with incredibly smart ideas. You know, more, more recently, you know, incredible biotech, everybody calls it, and pharmaceuticals and treatments. But the way that care has been administered hasn't changed in years. So we found a team that was very important for us to, that was, had really a like-minded view of innovation, not just doing things they were old, the way they were always done. And that is surprisingly, a lot of, you know, some, some very good mid-level, you know, career professionals, they rec I, I never realized this until you get into this, that we really had something to offer somebody who, had a lot, who came with incredible credentials because they went, well, this is, these are guys that are innovating. You know, I can stay over here in the traditional system and 40 years from now, I can retire and I'll be you know, fat and happy and that's just fine. Or I can go and do make a difference. You know, we're not trying to compete with the hospital systems. We're just an extension of care to keep operations running for employers and governments. That's, that's a very different kind of a thing. And yeah. you know, look at our board of directors. Our, our chair is former GSK. He was CIO when he was there. We also have the former chief digital officer from Bayer on our board. The current chief medical officer at GE is on our board. Uh, and I always like to say my corporate structure conscience, and the one that really makes sure we're being diligent because we are a company, is a former chief marketing officer from Sprint. Fantastic. What a great lineup. And you care so much about surrounding yourself with talented people. It must be remarkable to get all of these different ideas coming in to sort of the central location so you can make great decisions for your company, which then provides an opportunity for your clients to get the best possible service that you can offer in the world. Andrew, when we think about it, you mentioned telehealth, telehealth. And of course, I've used telehealth in the last couple of years. I love it. I'm Mr. Telehealth now. Let's talk about that. How important has that been in your business? Or is it just a small fraction right now of what you offer to your clients? It's becoming something that we're scaling out. And the reason why is you know, telehealth kind of comes in two buckets. Everybody always thinks of telehealth as, you know, what you and I, because I do the same thing. You know, for a lot of your things, when I go to my doctor, what I do is I do all my, you know, my, my just finally did my first physical in a while because, you know, nobody's been going to the doctor for a while. So I did my physical, went to the lab, had the lab stuff sent in, and then we had our first telehealth call and we reviewed the results kind of as a first step to look for markers. And that was, okay, that's, that was a very new experience for me. And realistically, for, for, for the majority of doctors, bless them, there's some amazing doctors out there. That's a quantum leap from what they were doing 36 months ago. Let's face it. You know, telehealth before that was a fax machine and a pager, and I'm not exaggerating. Okay, so that it came full circle. It's been here for years. Just the industry wasn't ready to make that change for multiple reasons. You know, everything from limitations to insurance to it. Hospital systems want to support all of it. The world has changed. The, my, our, the way we see telehealth is it's more about putting telehealth at the workplace and at the work site. And the reason why is it gives us the ability to be in more places at one time. You know, and telehealth, the only problem with telehealth, the, 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 the challenge with it, the barrier is that exactly what we're doing here in this interview. On one side of telehealth, you've got a challenge where, you know, if I have an ear infection, you can't look inside my ear from a telehealth call. That's, you know, as a doctor. So, so a physician for primary care can't do that. But if we have a device, which we now put with this part of what we're doing in clinics on site, that does a number of diagnostics and there's a PA, a physician's assistant on site, a proper doctor can sit on the other side of that call. So otherwise, in other words, we're not forcing an employer to pay for 100% of a doctor's time sitting there 24-7 looking for something to do. 
We've got them now. If they need to come in, that changes things. But the idea is a PA, a physician's assistant, can be there, do all the essential stuff because they're qualified to do that, follow the direction of the doctor, provide ultrasounds or you know, whatever else you're able to. We could do x-rays, but there's a whole thing about radiation, so we're a little bit careful about that one for obvious reasons. But the idea is all of those functions are now assisted by telehealth, so things happen at the, at the factory floor. So what does the employee get? Immediate care, right? And they still get that same level of service. And we're really leveraging technology to do that. And, and that's a very different kind of a model than the traditional telehealth. If, if you want to call it traditional, it's only been a few years that everybody's been doing this, but it's, it changes the way that way the ways get delivered. And I think it's going to be a happier customer. Yeah. You're changing the dynamic for sure. What's mm-hmm. the bandwidth of Bloom? In other words, what types of companies, what size companies can reach out to you and sort of take advantage of this full suite, this full platform, this mm-hmm. full consultation that you offer? We really, our sweet spot really is kind of Fortune 500. And the reason why is the scale makes sense for them because part of what we're doing is we're helping them gather data. Now, it's obviously, you know, it's confidential data and it's anonymized and it's not like somebody can view individuals' information, but at scale, because then they can really start doing risk assessment on the business. So we do, our sweet spot definitely is Fortune 500. Though it's, what's interesting is we're also doing a lot with film and TV productions on the testing side. And now they've turned to us and said, what can you do for us for health? You know, if they've got thousands of unionized workers, the union is saying, what are you doing for us? I'm, I'm not sure if you caught the news, but I think it was six or seven months ago, you know, the film unions were about to go on strike because of working conditions. You know, the, and they're overworked and, you know, it, let, let's face it, you know, content is an all time high for demand. Netflix, Disney, YouTube, and they're, they're just they're consuming tons of content and there's a huge demand for this. So there's more productions than ever, which means more demands on the worker. So how do you keep that worker healthier? And it's ironic that, you know, quite, quite, quite reasonably, we could be one of the many things. When you see a production being set up, I mean, a production is really a small company when you think about it. You get the craft services guys, the makeup guys, the, the lighting, the sound, they all kind of come in. It's almost like a circus. They all, all the different tents come in to make the thing work. Well, now the health portion comes and that's us. I so, love so it. And I think we do well think- for the small guy and the big guy, depending on what they, I'm sorry to interrupt you, depending on what they do. It's the small, it really is, our sweet spot really for longer term occupational health is definitely larger, but then we're able to really scale. And I think the film and TV productions taught us how to do that. I love it. I love it. It's so interesting. You know, we have a teachable moment here because listen, Andrew, we have a lot of younger entrepreneurs that watch the show as well. They're in startup mode. We have people that are getting their seed rounds, their series A, B, C rounds. They're trying to be this fortune 500, fortune 100 company. So I think a lot of entrepreneurs after they hear you speak might be asking this question. What's it like to engage with a fortune 100 or fortune 500 company? What's it look like? I mean, who's talking to who is it? C-level execs talking to C-level execs. How long does it take for a fortune 100 or 500 company to make a decision like going with bloom? What's the fabric of doing business with these massive international, you know, household name brand companies. The the, the real challenge, I always say this KYC, know your customer. That's the most important thing. You've got to understand what's important to that business because really we are really a function of them staying open. It doesn't matter what you're doing for them. If it's a, you know, a new software app, it doesn't matter what, what it happens to be. Gosh, it could be a better way to dispense toilet paper. You know, if you're a young entrepreneur with really cool ideas, Make sure you understand what the real needs are of the client. If you're bringing value, that's when they get interested. And then understand which part of those layered giant organizations has a need and, and which one actually get benefits from this. I, I can't say that enough. You know, my his, Historically, if you look at my past at all, I worked in telecoms for a long time, dealing with very large global telecom manuf- uh, uh, providers. And we were doing manufacturing on a mass scale, on a global scale. And our clients were massive, you know, hundreds of thousands of subscribers. I see be some scale, you know, and in many cases, millions, hundreds of millions of subscribers. So for them, you know, human resources has a need, business has a need, you know, sales has a need. The thing about health and where we are now is the real need that we feel are, I mean, it's, it's interesting to me that the majority of the meetings that we sit in with Fortune 500 now, we'll start with human resources or maybe, you know, the safety person, but inevitably the CEO always comes in and goes, hey guys, I got a real problem here. Can you solve it? You know, and, and that's, that's, I can't say that enough to entrepreneurs understand what their needs are. And, and I always say this to anybody out there doing business development, go with your ears, ask them, you know, explain to us how your business works. And that'll tell, that'll tell you right away if your solution actually is solving a problem. 
That's powerful. I mean, for the younger entrepreneurs watching the show, rewind what Andrew just said. He kind of gave you a little mini Harvard or Stanford MBA there. Pick your school, of course, or Michigan MBA. Great, great advice. Now, let's talk about the future. You know, Bloom Health Partners, you know, again, it's just an honor to have you on the show. What's it look like in the future? Where do we go from here with Bloom? What's the next evolution, if you will, about where your company's going? The, the evolution is deeper and wider to the data component because that's really what people want. You know, businesses are trying to figure out long-term planning. You know, because you know, consider a CEO's concern at a Fortune 50, Fortune 100 company. They're probably all public, <laughs> otherwise you wouldn't know they're a Fortune 100. So their challenges are: okay, how do I tell investors that our model works for the next five, ten years? Especially coming out of what was a very complicated last few years, where things were very uncertain. Well, now the entire table is gone and now they have to reset all the, all the information in front of them. Okay. So for us, it's about using health and giving them their, that ability for them at the very least to tell them long-term predictably, here's what our most important asset's going to be doing. Here's how many people are going to be healthy. Here's how long we're, we're probably going to get in terms of lifespan out of our health and, and, and of the employees. And something else, which nobody's really talking about much is mental health. And the direction with this is us to take it there because really that's, you know, I always say the same thing, you know, if a good attitude you know, brings a strong body, right? I always say that. And it's very true. I mean, there's something to that. I'm, I mean, I'm a big believer in science, but at the same time, good attitude that never hurts, you know, and, you know, there isn't a, there isn't an oncology word out there that, that can't use a little joke once in a while. That's the real thing. Right. And it does always, it just, it's proven. It does help. You look at think take that into a mass scale where you've got hundreds or thousands of employees. If you have people where there's low morale and there's real issues and you have no beat on that, it's going to come and surprise you one day. And getting ahead of it's the only way. And we're now coming out of a place where there are many suffering from what we'll call PTSD as a result of the pandemic. So there's an opportunity for the employer to offer something to somebody that's in need right now in their employee base, but then that gets to stay. You know, once they get beyond all this and we get past all this, whenever the heck that's going to be, who knows at this point. But longer term, the idea now is the employer is going to have a read on the general mood of the place four, five, six years from now. You know, if the economy is taking a turn, they'll know right away if it's affecting the employees or not. So powerful. It's such great data in the hands of people that have such a big responsibility to their employees and their shareholders, of course. And by using this data-driven model that you provide and providing them the right data at the right time, they can look into the future about what's about to happen. And this whole idea about mental health. I mean, it's so important. And I'm a big believer in having an engaged workforce. I'm a big believer that, yes, mental health is so important. If somebody comes to work and they're not at the top of their game, and maybe they do have some of this PTSD that you mentioned, that can spread like wildfire. And that type of workforce just doesn't get it done like a fully engaged, happy, fulfilled workforce. So I think this is just amazing. It definitely resonates for me. It's definitely in tune with my belief about mental health and physical health and how they're connected. And we're big believers in science as well, Andrew. Listen, this has been a great interview. I know you've only got out a certain amount of time, but I wanted to end it talking to the younger entrepreneurs who watch the show, Andrew, because they're in startup mode, some of them. Maybe they're raising some funds. That, you know, They're all in love with their technology or their platform or whatever they're building but maybe they're hitting a pothole in the road. Maybe they're hitting a wall. Maybe they're hitting something they can't get through and they don't know what to do about it. So I'm hoping, Andrew, based on your breadth of experience that you could give some insight to the younger entrepreneurs watching the show about what it takes to get through a tough time as an entrepreneur and keep on going. You know, I always say this, it takes a village, you know, from advisors, from friends, from everyone else, you know, and I always give a, I always call it the grandmother test with a business idea. I mean, tell it to some people that have no clue. Your grandmother probably doesn't know much about your app you're developing. For example, as an entrepreneur, go to folks that, that have a completely fresh pair of eyes and say, does this sound like something people would use? If it's that easy. Now, if they're developing some algorithm that's really complex, you're probably going to want to go ask a math major. But at the same time, always phone a friend. You know, it, it takes a village to build these things. Such good advice. I love it so much. The grandmother test. That's a good one. I, I've never heard that one before, but that could be the title of your next book coming out. Yes. Andrew Morton's grandmother test. Listen, I love it so much. Congratulations on what you're doing. I'm really honored to have you on the show. Thank you so much for slicing out some time for us. I'm going to bring you back and I want to devote the entire 30 minutes 
to entrepreneurship because there's so much to learn from the way in which you know your your career has led you to build what's happening at Bloom with these great board of advisors, this great board of directors, this great team you've been able to put together. I think we just want to focus right in for 30 minutes on your entrepreneurial journey. And I think that the entrepreneurs watching to the watching the show will just be stuck, you know, to the to the to the screen, listening to what you have to say. So thank you so much, Andrew, for coming on the dot com magazine entrepreneur spotlight series today. This has been fantastic. It's my, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks.